as the French say, make no knees. knees. <laughs> I, I don't know. I've been practicing it all day. And, and uh, you know, just uh, uh, it was a lot better when the guy, the French guy on YouTube said it. But uh, uh, I'm going to stop sharing so we can have Jim Rudolph Hessler give us a very sickles Christmas. What better way to end uh, the evening with a nice truffle of sickles, huh? What do you say, Jim? screen here uh we're gonna do a very sickles christmas and my theme is specifically conflicts within the army of the potomac during the winter of 1862 and 63 so dovetails a little bit into some of what doug was saying in the last presentation um now i had originally planned on doing a 12 days of christmas type theme but then i realized that i didn't really have 12 unique connections to make tonight and frankly didn't have the time to do it so as I was putting kind of this nine panel grid together, it started to remind me of the Brady Bunch. And who doesn't remember the classic, A Very Brady Christmas? And hence, that's the title of tonight's presentation, A Very Sickles Christmas. So if you're kind of wondering where that came from. So here's the story of a man named Sickles who had a third core of his very own. No, I'm not going to do the Brady Bunch all night, but I couldn't resist that one. Um, now, when I think of the holiday season, of course... I think of Dan Sickles pretty much as I do during any season. Um, but, you know, we think of this as a festive time of the year spent with family and friends. And as I said during the outset, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the conflicts within the Army that occurred during the winter of 1862 and 63, because I think it was that time of year that created many of the frictions and conflicts between George Meade and Dan Sickles that ultimately exploded and erupted at the Battle of Gettysburg. So, you know, I would argue that this is one of the most important yet overlooked periods of the Gettysburg campaign within the Army of the Potomac. You know, I think too often uh, Doug just railed on a historian, so I'm going to rail on some historians a little bit. I think too often historians say that Meade and Sickles simply disliked each other because one went to West Point and the other one didn't. Uh, you know, and frankly, that's, I think, some lazy, shallow history. So, you know, we're going to go in deeper into that in six or seven minutes as much as the time permits. So we're going to start in December of 1862. At that time, as you guys probably know, Sickles was a division commander in the Third Corps, and Meade was in the First Corps. And I think although Sickles was never really looked upon favorably by the West Point cliques in the Army, I don't think there's a whole lot of evidence that the two men, Sickles and Meade, you know, really despised each other yet. That's going to come in the ensuing months. And for me, the Meade Sickles star story always starts at the Battle of Fredericksburg in December of 62, as we add David Burney to our uh, to our family here. Now, if you remember, during the fighting on December 13th of 62, Meade's division had exploited a gap uh, in Stonewall Jackson's lines, uh, but was ultimately and eventually repulsed in part because he didn't have any support. Now, during the attack, Meade had requested support from General Burney's 3rd Corps Division. But Reynolds, who was up nearby on the scene, had basically ordered Burney to support some batteries and then retire. So in Burney's thinking, he was under Reynolds' orders and he really couldn't come to Meade's support. By at least one account, you know, Meade, the old snapping turtle, had pretty much profanely tore into Burney on the, uh, on the battlefield. So afterwards, Meade would tell his wife that he and Burney would, quote, always have Fredericksburg between us. And I would add, too, that Meade also blamed John Reynolds for a little bit of that fiasco. Uh, but Meade kind of asked that that commentary not be not be uh, made public knowledge. But even worse for Bernie, Bernie and Meade were both Philadelphians. And then Bernie was angered when, you know, his Fredericksburg conduct was discussed in social circles that Meade and uh, Bernie shared within Philadelphia. So again, we don't have a lot of time to go into this tonight. Whoever was in the wrong on it, uh, the net result was that at Fredericksburg, Meade had made an enemy of General Bernie within the Third Corps. And when Meade assumed command of the Army of the Potomac on the eve of Gettysburg, you know, people were writing and saying things to the effect that Meade was disliked in the Corps, especially by Bernie. And hopefully now you understand why, because it started 
at the Battle of Fredericksburg. So I've always argued that really Bernie was, um, you know, Bernie at that same time was starting to become a Dan Sickles partisan. And I've always argued that much of Sickles' first tastes of sort of anti me bias probably came directly from Bernie. And I think Fredericksburg in December of 62 has a lot to do with that. So now as we move into the year, we're going to add Joe Hooker and Dan Butterfield to the grid here. Kind of to save time, I'm going to add a few people up at the same time here. But as you guys probably know, after Fredericksburg and before Hooker took over in late December of 62, Burnside replaced Butterfield as commander of the Fifth Corps with our very own George Meade, who was actually senior to Butterfield. So while that made sense within the Army, and a lot of people supported the idea of Meade taking over the Fifth Corps, as you can imagine, Butterfield didn't like the idea. So this sort of created a little bit of friction then between Meade and Butterfield. But then when Hooker took over the Army in early January, he kept Butterfield on as chief of staff. So now you've got this situation going on where you've got basically a guy who is not very favorable to Meade at headquarters under Joe Hooker. So as we all know, when Meade, you know, as we all know, when Meade took command of the Army of the Potomac and tried to replace Butterfield uh, as chief of staff, there was more to it than just this idea of trying to bring in a new regime. Meade and Butterfield had a history together and they didn't like each other, which ultimately for Meade made it doubly dangerous to have Butterfield staying on as chief of staff. Um, at one point, Meade had written his wife that, quote, Hooker is ambitious and very susceptible of flattery. And Butterfield has been playing on the weaknesses. So Meade could kind of see how Butterfield was kind of uh, working his magic on Hooker, so to speak. So if you're keeping score, now we have Meade on the outs with Bernie, and we have Meade on the outs with Butterfield. And I still really haven't brought Sickles into the uh, story yet, but I will now as we get into the new year. And we're going to add Regis de Trabriand to the story. So Chris's, Chris's uh, very poor attempt at French earlier I thought was ironic because I know I was going to bring de Trabriand into the mix. But I always say that after the reorganizations, really, I think much of the Army of the Potomac's efforts in the winter of 1863, 62-63, seemed to really focus on throwing parties in winter quarters. And, you know, because it's the holiday season, this is one of the reasons why I thought I would tell this story. You know, we're all thinking of holiday parties. Tonight's a little bit of a party. And um, Sickles really opened what would be the momentous year of 1863, by throwing a huge New Year's party. Um, so I cheated here a little bit. It's really more like Dan Sickles' rocking New Year's Eve than it is an actual Christmas party because I didn't have a Sickles at Christmas story. But Sickles throws this huge New Year's party that a lot of people were talking about and, and writing about. And when you're Dan Sickles and you want to rock out on New Year's Eve, what do you do? You hire a band and you hire a guy who chirruped like a bird. So that was their entertainment, this guy making bird noises. Uh, Regis de Trabriand, which is why I've added him to the grid here, wrote about the party. And he said Sickles did things in, quote, grand style. And he kept an open house at his headquarters. The champagne and whiskey ran in streams. And have we ever met a Frenchman who didn't like to drink? I know I haven't. Now, it was during this period, oops, I skipped ahead for a minute. It was during this period that Sickles, Butterfield, and Hooker now start to become close friends within the Army. And it's really this trio that's setting, you know, what I always kind of call the Army's social and morality standards in the months prior to Gettysburg. Uh, Captain Charles Adams has a famous quote from this period where he says, the Army of the Potomac sank to its lowest point. It was commanded by a trio, each of whom the least said the better. During that winter when Hooker was in command, I can say from personal knowledge that headquarters of the Army was a place to which no self-respecting man liked to go and no decent woman would go. It was a combination of bar room and brothel. So if you've ever heard that quote before, that's the period that that quote comes from. And what's interesting, though, with the Gettysburg dynamic is Meade was clearly excluded from this social circle. If you've ever read Meade's Life and Letters, and you know, there's a whole plethora of Meade biographies coming out on the market these days. 
it's clear during this period that Meade was excluded basically from the cool kids table at the Army of the Potomac cafeteria. Uh, when Hooker got promoted, Meade told his wife, I believe Hooker is a good soldier. The danger he runs is of subjecting himself to bad influences, such as Dan Butterfield and Dan Sickles, who being intellectually more clever than Hooker and leading him to believe they are very influential, will obtain an injurious ascendancy over him and insensibly affect his conduct. Now, in mid-February, when Meade was grousing because he couldn't get a leave of absence from Hooker, he sarcastically complained that, quote, I do not like his entourage. Such gentlemen as Dan Sickles and Dan Butterfield are not the persons I should select as my intimates, however worthy and superior they may be. Um, and you see other letters to Margaret in the same vein. So what we see from the future commander of the Army of the Potomac is tension anger, and frankly, resentment at being excluded by these guys. So on March 17th, they celebrate St. Patrick's Day. One officer wrote, Hooker looked superb, followed by a great crowd of staff officers and a retinue of mounted ladies. And the New York Herald added, Sickles was there, suave and courteous as Sickles always is. So folks, if you've ever kind of wondered, you know, what did women, what did people see in Dan Sickles? Because, you know, frankly, his portraits, I don't know, don't always, I don't think do him justice. There you go. Suave and courteous as Sickles always is. And this is where I had Charles Wainwright to the slide. Wainwright also wrote about the party and he wrote, quote, how they managed to score up such a number of females, I cannot imagine. And yet the parties continue into the spring and Meade was still excluded. In mid-March, he goes to pay a visit on Hooker and Meade writes, quote, the general was absent at a grand wedding, which took place yesterday in camp, followed last night by a ball. And I understand another ball is given tonight by General Sickles. Not being honored with an invitation to these festivities, I did not go. So there you go again, parties, New Year's, St. Patrick's Day, weddings, everybody in the army's invited except George Meade. Hell, even Chaplain Joe Twitchell got an invite. And I always kind of wondered how did Chaplain Twitchell kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of reconcile his faith with this bar room and brothel thing. But Chaplain Twitchell giggled afterwards that he drank some wine with the newly promoted Major General Sickles and he found Sickles most familiar and agreeable. And so again, we see this ostracization of George Meade continuing. What I would say as we start to wrap up here, uh, as you plan your own holiday gatherings, you know, perhaps you're the Dan Sickles in your family, suave and courteous as always. But when you send out those invites, remember the awkward, the socially awkward George Meade in your family, because it might come back to bite you someday, uh, like eventually it does with Dan Sickles which of course takes us to Gettysburg. So, you know, I did this, I tried to do this in, oh, I don't know, about 10 minutes or so tonight. Obviously there's a lot more to the story uh, than what I covered, but what I would say is, you know, these are not frivolous, trivial interactions. I get that the military guys always say that it's about terrain and terrain drives the battle and all of that stuff. And that may or may not be true, but it's history is about people and it's about these interactions in these conflicts that lead to history and it led to the Mead Sickles breakdown on July 2nd. And I think we can clearly see a strained relationship between Hooker, Sickles, Butterfield, Bernie, and Mead as the summer of 1863 approached. Now it's going to get even worse at Chancellorsville. But folks, we're out of time. And if you want to hear more about Chancellorsville, I'll be in Chancellorsville on May 14th, 2022, giving a tour. So uh, reach out to me if you uh, have any questions about that. But that leads us to me wishing you and all of you a very Sickles Christmas. Now, I do have one more thing here, if you can indulge me for 30 seconds to a minute at the most, because I've been talking about holiday parties this is a holiday party. One of my favorite images of a holiday party. I wish Mead and Sickles would have got along like this. Oh, and, and here we go.
I see the chat room is exploding <laughs> with this. Oh, yeah. I love the peanuts. We're just going to wait for the piano solo. Okay. It's coming up. That's me on the dance floor. This looks like the guide room. All right. All right. And we'll turn it back over to you, Chris, on that note. And we only lost one person during Charlie Brown. So I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> oh, well, thanks, Jim. And, and certainly uh, uh, G uh, Rick, Jerry, Chris, Deb, Doug, and Jim, thank you so much for making it yet another wonderful Christmas smorgasbord. And uh, most of all, thank uh, everybody for coming tonight. Thank you for all of your support throughout the year.